Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Reimagine IPO DWDM with Convert Optical Routing, sponsored by Juniper. Before we begin, I will cover a few housekeeping items. On the left-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, please type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get to answer you, you may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resources widget. Near the end of today's presentation, please take one minute to complete the survey that's open on your screen. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to Heavy Reading's Senior Principal Analyst, Sterling Perry. Sterling? Thank you, Barbara, and hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, Reimagine IP over DWDM with Converged Optical Routing, sponsored by Juniper. Um, I would say this is probably the hottest topic within optics um, this year. So a uh, very exciting time to, to be uh, in optics and routing, and that's the, the topic of today. I'll be the host and moderator for the next hour and I'll be joined by Moran Roth, Director of Product Management with Juniper, and uh, Moog Dendukuri, Product Manager also with, with Juniper Network. So we'll kind of trade um, presenting as we go through. Here's the agenda. Um, I'll kick things off looking at optical networking market trends, some research data that we have uh, on the topic, and then um, we'll move on to market drivers and benefits digging into solution requirements. Uh, we'll close out with some recent case studies uh, because we are seeing deployments these days, uh, which is quite exciting. And then we should have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So as Barbara explained, please ask questions as we go through and we'll get to as many as we can um, at, the, at the end of the webinar, uh, hopefully 10 minutes. So, you know, everybody's kind of in a different spot in terms of where they are with looking at integration of optics. So I'm just gonna start at a very high level and then of course we'll move in more detail as we go through. But what exactly is IP over DWDM? It's, it's a new architecture or a, a different architecture than what has traditionally been deployed in, in networks. And so um, the, the graphic on this slide uh, hopefully depicts the, the differences between a traditional optical architecture and a, an IP over DWDM network. So traditionally, while there has been um, uh, interoperability at, at the routing layer, layer three, the optical layer has historically been uh, owned and controlled by a single vendor. That would include the DWDM terminals with the transponders, the line system, and the management of that system. That is historically and, and really, really up to today how optical networks have been built out. Of course, they can work with, with routers from different vendors. With IP over DWDM, what operators are doing is taking those terminals uh, and removing those from the network, um, those, those transponder shells, and integrating the optics directly into the, the, the switch and router. Um, so it's the elimination of the DWDM shells. It requires pluggable optics, and really what we're seeing is, is a resurgence in the, in the trend due to the advent of the 400 ZR and ZR plus pluggable optics. But beyond the optics, there's a lot of different components to it. But the, the, the main thing is that you're integrating the optics into the router. Um, and, and really what you need to, to do that, if you want any interoperability, will be an open optical line system where the pluggables from different vendors will, will ride over a, a common line system. And there's different ways to, to, to manage it. And so continuing a multi-vendor network on the IP side. So now we're moving to multi-vendor IP and, and optical layers. Um, it's not new as a concept. Anybody who's been in the industry uh, will, will know that back to at 2000 and maybe even earlier, we were talking about IP over DWDM. But there's been some major changes that have really brought this back as a viable architecture and why we're talking about it today. I mentioned, and we'll talk quite a bit about the, the ZR, which was the OIF, uh, standardized pluggable optics, which for the first time in history were able to remove, uh, eliminate the faceplate trade-off 
uh, that really had dogged IP over DWDM, which was historically to take a client's a, a line side optic and stick it into a, a router, you would actually have to have the capacity of that routing system, which was a no-go. Now that the line side optic is in the same form factors as the um, as the client side, and that really kicked things off. But there's more to that. There's the standardization of, of the optics for, for multi-vendor interoperability. I mentioned briefly the, the um, open line system uh, to really have an interoperable network where you can have optics from, from multiple vendors. So that's kind of a, a, a prerequisite to, to moving into IP over DWDM, I would argue. And then one other thing that's often overlooked is, is just the capacity trend that we've had over the past 20 years. Router capacity has been growing at, at Moore's Law type of capacity, um, maybe say about 45% um, CAGR in, in routing capacity over the past decade plus. Optics with WDM has only been growing at about 20% uh, compound annual growth rate. So Moore's Law exceeds what's been done in optics. Um, and so where we've reached, and what I, I put here on the slide, is there's sufficient router capacity to, to make this architecture viable, where in the past, routing capacity was so precious that the idea of, of running your um, transit traffic through a, a router was, was really um, not economically uh, viable. So sufficient capacity where we don't have to look at an architecture based as default on router bypass, the era of router bypass. I wouldn't say it's over, but it's not a, a, a given in all, in all instances, which is very important for, for this type of architecture where the routing is taking on a much more important role in, in the transport of, of the traffic. Um, 20 years of IP over DWDM, there's been a lot of vendor push, um, Juniper among them, but, but not, not alone. Uh, vendors have been interested in this architecture for years. Well, what's very different now is that we're seeing a, a real operator pull, which really is when something's going to take off, you need the customers really interested in it. And this is just one data point of many that we have showing how much interest, and this is telecom operators, communication service providers from the survey, how much interest they have in this type of architecture and their intents to deploy it. Um, this was a survey we conducted um, just this year. Um, Cloud Metro survey, the results are all published. And we asked about where these network operators, again, telecom intends to deploy coherent pluggable optics. 65% in the next three years intend, it may not happen exactly, it could be ambitious, but they intend to deploy these in switches and routers. It's an amazing statistic, a very powerful endorsement for IP over DWDM, given that of all these options listed on, on, the, um, uh, on the chart is, is the newest and most uh, radical architecture of them all. This is where operators really want to deploy the, the pluggables. And that's really going to be the focus of today's webinar. Uh, with that, let me hand over to, uh, I believe Moran will, will kick things off for us. Thank you, Sterling. So I wanted to start with, we experience an acceleration of the adoption of this IP over DWDM. Sterling showed in the previous slide uh, the survey results that many service providers are looking to integrate these new coherent pluggables uh, into routers and switches. And this is really what we experienced in the last couple of years. And I wanted to start by maybe reiterating some of the points that Sterling made about what, why this time it's different, why this time we do see acceleration adoption. And I was working in a company more than 20 years ago uh, where there was a wave of, I would say, the first attempt to do this IP over DWDM integration. Back then, it was with 10 gig DWDM interfaces. And that small company eventually failed. And it's for those reasons that we are talking about here, that why today it's different. The fact that we have standard DWDM coherent interfaces today. This is a key enabler for wide adoption because it avoid vendor locking. It enable extensibility across different use cases because now you don't need to control and use the same vendor across the link. So that's a key difference today that we have standard based OIF and OpenZR plus um, coherent interfaces. 
Another key difference is the ability to pack this coherent technology into compact form factor with QSFP DD and have the same density with DWDM interfaces and client interfaces. In the past, you had to have a dedicated DWDM line card in a router that compromised the density of the host. Not any longer. Advancement in photonics and in the silicon um, development and the ASIC developments allow, allow us today to have hosts that really can mix and match and have full density of these high performance coherent uh, pluggables. And Sterling, I think in the next slide, we have our first uh, poll question for the audience. We do, we do, thanks, uh, Moran. So first poll question, and hopefully it is up in front of everybody. Uh, I will read it out here. We'll give a minute or two for everybody to weigh in and, and then uh, we'll, we'll see what we get. But uh, quite curious about um, plans to deploy IP over DWDM architectures. I, I showed one, one bit of research that, that we had uh, showing there's expectations that are quite high. Curious what this audience thinks. When do service providers plan to deploy IP over DWDM? Um, the options are you already have. Uh, within one year, within two years, um, still undecided, uh, or or no plans to, to, to do so. So we'll give a moment for uh, everybody to weigh in. Um, I did mention up front that we're going to have time for Q&A at the end as well. In addition to the poll questions, we already got some questions coming in, which is great. Um, as expected, there's quite a bit of, of interest in this topic. Uh, let me, yeah, let me push now. I don't want to delay things too much here. Let me just do a, a little bit of a refresh. So, um, you know, interesting, Moran, I'll let you comment since, since, since you were on. Um, a little over a quarter of this audience, um, either either if your service provider is already deployed, if you're if you're um, selling in, uh, this is where they're seeing their customers. Uh, over a quarter, slightly already, uh, another 11% a year, and then kind of goes from there. A large amount undecided, 44%. Um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, what do you think? See, yeah, we can see here that more than 50%, uh, maybe just more than 50% are already uh, well into this journey, right? Either already started or very uh, soon think of uh, starting deploying. So this is what we see. We see a lot of adoption that, as I think everybody knows, started from hyperscalers with the data center interconnect at high volumes. But this year, uh, we see a lot of uh, activity and start of adoption with service providers. And I think the poll uh, results uh, shows that as well. Yeah, interesting, the undecided. I did a, a little bit of an update push, but yeah, 40%. You know, these, these are people that are interested in trying to figure out. That's why they're on the webinar. So this is where you and your competitors and colleagues ha have your work to do to, to move them from undecided to decided. But uh, yeah, let's... Uh, Let's keep moving. Yeah. OK, so let's talk about why we see this uh, adoption, right? And why the undecided uh, should really take a serious look into the benefits of this new architecture. So at the first um, look, the promise of IP over DWDM integrating the coherent transceivers directly into the router eliminates the transponder, right? Eliminate the optical transponder from, from the system. And this has significant advantages in terms of obviously eliminating CAPEX, but also uh, OPEX, right? You don't need to manage uh, and train personnel and manage that over life. You reduce power consumption from the network because you are eliminating essentially a set of equipment from your uh, network. But it's, it, it's not just 
the elimination of the transponder that and the capex associated with that it's also the simplification of the network the collapsing of the ip and optical layer into a single element really uh, provide benefits for the overall network operation and just to give one example um, when we are typically when we are doing protection today in an ip over traditional transport the uh, optical transport network typically the transport layer the optical layer will provide one-to-one -one protection essentially dedicating 50 percent of the spectrum of the bandwidth for protection that is very wasteful when we are integrating this uh, technologies together and we are providing the visibility of the optical layer to the router we can do the protection at the service layer and that's much more granular and provide much more um, bandwidth efficiency so again this is just one example how this integration promise much more efficiency at the network layer than just the transponder elimination so we conducted a, an analysis of what will be the tco savings of these uh, transition from traditional uh, network architecture as um, sterling showed at the beginning and uh, moving to ip over dwdm integrating this coherent transceiver directly into the router so you can see here that the capex savings just by eliminating this transponder at the network level are more than 40 percent and the opex savings where we are taking into account power and space are more than 50 percent overall savings and then carbon footprint which become more and more important as our companies pledge to reduce uh, carbon emission over time is also significantly reduced uh, more than 50 percent reduction in carbon footprint for the network so the, when we sum everything up we see a tco saving of more than 45 percent and seeing other tco analysis that we uh, we see in the market we believe that our model is relatively uh, conservative sterling yeah just just to take you up on, on that last point so um this is a, a bit of survey data uh that we did again telecom uh, operators this was a, a little bit while back this was uh back in 2021 uh, but we asked at the very beginning uh, of this trend, what level of TCO savings do operators anticipate moving into IP over DWDM? And um, you can see that the numbers anticipated were actually a bit more conservative than, than uh, Moran, what, what, what you just showed, 40% saying it over 20%, um, 40 to 60%, which was kind of your range, uh, 15, you know, 22% saying it, they, that's what they expect. Uh, so, so your numbers are are higher higher than what the operators expected initially. The interesting thing is that we have some very early deployments, uh, the leading edge adopters who've moved to this, and the numbers that we're seeing them publish are are more aggressive. Forget about this slide; they're more aggressive than what you just showed. So, I would agree 100% that. Your analysis, based on what we, we see from early movers, uh, which would include Aurelian and, and Colt, uh, among some others, are uh, greater savings of capex and opex than than, than what you're showing. So um, the, the the benefits are, are are quite real from from the operators that that have seen a value proposition and have actually moved forward commercially. Uh, with that, I think I hand over to Amog. Yep. Uh, thanks, Sterling. Um, so I think as we saw in the last slide from a TCO perspective and just overall network simplicity perspective, hopefully it's becoming you know, more clear to the 40% of folks who marked undecided in the last poll, you know, what IP over DWDM is about and why it's likely being sought out by operators. Now, maybe kind of taking a slightly different angle on this, right? As many of the folks on this webinar are likely entering their planning phase for deployment that are, you know, one to two years out, 
one of the questions you're likely asking is, how can I deploy IP over DWDM in a way that's flexible, sustainable, and, and automated, right? When we at Juniper sought out to define our converged optical routing architecture solution, we placed special emphasis on kind of addressing some of these key operational pain points uh, by delivering against three pillars, which we feel are critical to the success of an IP over DWDM transformation. Uh, first of which is extensible architectures, which really starts first from standardization and enabling seamless interoperable deployments in multi-vendor networks, right? Whether it be the optical specification, the form factor, or even the host interface, focusing on standards we feel is absolutely key, especially as the ecosystem of coherent plugs continues to grow and interoperability will be an important piece of the flexibility aspect of the solution. Um, I think the other aspect of extensible architectures is having access to a complete portfolio of high performance coherent pluggables to enable collapsing the layers in a wide variety of use cases. And I think one part of that is just being able to select the right solution at the right price point for your application, whether that be ZR, ZR plus, uh, or even the newer zero DBM high output power ZR plus plugs emerging on the market now. But another big part that I think we can't overlook is intimately tied to the system integration, right? Enabling configuration and monitoring of ZR, ZR plus modules and their various operating modes to tailor the configuration of these pluggables to the capacity and reach requirements of your use case. Uh, second, the second pillar here is sustainable systems. And I think everybody in this industry is becoming very familiar with the idea that it's not just about pushing the best possible performance in a vacuum, right? It's about achieving the best possible performance while still being able to march forward towards next generation sustainability goals, for instance, becoming carbon neutral, which is really becoming a top of mind consideration for, for many operators. And when we're talking about IP over DWDM, it really starts with the IP piece, right? At Juniper, we've always, based, we've always placed special emphasis on silicon and system innovation to drive higher performance in smaller and more power efficient footprints, building platforms that customers can grow with, right? Taking full advantage of 400 gig transport capacity today, 800 gig and beyond in the future. And from the, pers from the perspective of the coherent pluggables, every watt of power really does matter, right? Especially for larger scale deployments, uh, not only in terms of the ability for systems to provide adequate power and properly cool the modules, but also again, from a sustainability perspective, the increasing contribution that coherent optics will have to the overall power consumption of the network as this architecture begins to scale. The last pillar is intelligent automation. Um, I think most folks would agree that automation when done right can add incredible value in streamlining full lifecycle network operations. But as IP over DWDM becomes a fact of life for many operators, we can't overlook the fact that automation tools, for example, Juniper's Paragon, will be able to do so with vastly improved uh, multi-layer visibility, right? The integration of ZRZR Plus into the router really means that the IP layer has access to incredible amounts of telemetry data, right? Insights into the health of the optical network that the router didn't previously have. Uh, and when you pair that rich data with a powerful data-driven automation tool, you're really able to unleash a whole slew of interesting multi-layer use cases, uh, which I'll touch on a little bit later in the session. The other aspect of automation and perhaps management more generally uh, is open networking, right? Having access to performance monitoring statistics and configuration knobs in a vendor agnostic way. And one of our focuses is support for open config to do just that, right? To enable our customers to uh, who want to build their best of breed management solution uh, to do so in with full openness. And that starts with support of relevant APIs and open data models like open config. With that, Sterling, I'll let you lead us through our next poll question. All right, yes, thank you. Here's our, our second uh, and final poll question. Um, again, uh, everybody take a look, uh, pick what applies to, to you. If, if you're a service provider, answer in terms of your own network. If you're a supplier into the industry, answer based on, on your interactions with your customers. The question here is what is the primary benefit? So it's pick one. What is the primary benefit that you expect to gain from the deployment of IP over DWDM? Um, increasing network bandwidth at lower total cost of ownership, um, <clears throat> converging IP and optical layers to reduce complexity, improving sustainability and reducing carbon footprint. Uh, as Mo kind of walked through uh, just now, some of the, the key benefits there. Uh, reducing dependency on third-party managed transport uh, devices, 
and or well yeah, actually all of the above sorry i i, I misspoke so if, if they're all equally important then uh then there is an out for you um pick, pick the last one so um let's give a moment for for folks to to weigh in and then i will uh push them out uh, i'm quite curious myself um you know, historically, I, I have not focused much on, on the sustainability aspect in this architecture, but uh, Amog, as you rightly point out, it's quite important at corporate level and government level these days. So I'm also curious how much that's going to start playing into some of these discussions in optical transport, uh, which has not generally been the focus, at least in the telecom market, of uh, for sustainability. Um, so, yeah, so let's see, what do we got? Yeah, 50%, all of the above. So uh, all of them resonating with a good solid half of the audience. If it's a pick one, it looks like it went to, well, interesting, reducing complexity uh, as, as the single most important benefit for those. Uh, I'm a little surprised, um, but uh, Amog, I'll, I'll let you weigh in since you were just presenting. Any surprises? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great question because I don't think there's a wrong answer. <laughs> I think it really speaks to the fact that different operators are seeking this out for different reasons. Um, but yeah, I think it, it is interesting that uh, reducing complexity is one of the, the big things, right? Uh, and and I think as, as the solution matures, that's certainly an aspect I'll speak to actually later in the session as well on how the, the management of this is sort of coming together and, and, and we can really help uh, reduce complexity now. But, but yeah, I think this is a really uh, interesting mix that, especially because more than about half, I guess, now that it changed, but about half said all of the above, yeah. which is which is great to see. Yes, right, more than one. Trends that tend to work tend to have more than one reason. So yeah, excellent. Uh, I found that very interesting. Uh, let's continue. I think, uh, is it is it Moran or? Uh... No, it's still me. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to dive a little deeper into that first pillar I talked about on the last slide of extensible architectures. So I wanted to share a little bit from the perspective of Juniper and how we're approaching the development of coherent optics and why we're sort of departing from what's for us business as usual, uh, because we know that coherent optics uh, are going to be a critical technology for the foreseeable future, right? So we're really taking a two-pronged approach for coherent optics. Like all other optics in our portfolio, we do have one product line of ZR and ZR Plus plugs. Uh, that's really an off-the-shelf product that we source from one of our vetted optical module vendors. We qualify it on our systems and then resell it as a Juniper qualified product. Now, the challenge for us is that this doesn't give us a lot of control into the technology um, or even the cost structure to compete in what's undoubtedly a price sensitive market, right? Uh, and this is where our second product line comes in, which we've branded as JCO, short for Juniper Coherent Optics. Uh, and really our JCO product line is a product of what we would call co-development partnerships that we're driving across the industry. So we're partnering with best in class suppliers all across the building block subcomponent supply chain, right? That would include the coherent DSP, the tunable laser, the optical subassembly, and so on, and are then having a, a partner build the modules for us. And this, of course, gives us a number of advantages, right? It allows us to build a best-in-class product at a highly competitive cost structure because we're partnering with the leaders in each technology subdomain. Uh, second, it gives us diversity and continuity of supply because on one hand, we have a fully integrated product that we get off the shelf, and a fully diversified product on the other hand that's kind of hand-selected and co-developed by Juniper. And perhaps most importantly to us, it gives us control into the technology, uh, including the firmware of ZR, ZR Plus Optic, right? Given that coherent optics and coherent DSPs are highly programmable, having that firmware level control is what allows us to innovate beyond the standard and expose interesting feature enhancements, right? Whether that be proprietary modes for high-touch customers who want to engineer high-performance links, uh, telemetry and management knobs, or even optimizing things like power and thermal management uh, at the system integration level by having our host software reconfiguring certain parameters of the module. Uh, but ultimately, the co-development model enables us to be an active player in the coherent optic space with a high amount of control into the technology and the solution that we're able to offer to our customers, which, again, as a systems integrator, we feel can make the transition to IP over DWDM uh, that much more kind of operationally attractive. So kind of talking about use cases a little, today by way of 400 gig ZR, ZR plus, and I, as I hinted at new zero DBM ZR plus optics, uh, you know, footprint optimized and fully standardized coherent plugs have the ability to service a wide range of use cases across DCI, Metro, regional, and even long haul. 
Uh, so this slide kind of illustrates the different modules and their respective use cases. So starting up top with ZR, ZR was primarily defined by the OIF to address the need for high capacity data center interconnect, right? ZR isn't about having the biggest, baddest coherent plug, right? It's really about having a power optimized solution for less performance driven DCI applications, leveraging a slightly uh, weaker FEC and limited CD tolerance, but achieving the reach that you need for that purpose built use case. When deployed in an amplified topology, 400 gig ZR can service 80 to 120 kilometers of reach while eliminating the need for a transponder. Now, for customers who are really looking to use ZR to service what we typically classify as ER or extended reach for 40 kilometer single mode fiber applications, they can move to a very simple point to point router interconnect topology, right? With ZR optics, displacing not only the transponder, but any need for amplification altogether. The Open ZR Plus standard can really be thought of as a superset, right? It takes the ZR, it leverages stronger forward error correction, stronger CD tolerance, offering the flexibility of multiple operating modes to enable coherent pluggables to extend to the service provider world while increasing, you know, while increasing the power consumption as marginally as technically possible. And now with zero dBm plugs available, um, and, and overcoming some of the performance barriers of low output power plugs, especially in Rotom based networks, ZR Plus is finally being seriously sought out in the service provider community. So from a use case perspective, when you deploy ZR Plus in an amplified link, you can achieve upwards of 500 kilometers in 400 gig mode and over 2000 kilometers in 200 and 100 gig modes. Uh, though many operators are indeed able to achieve even more than that based on the characteristics of their line system and fiber and so on. Uh, and similar to ZR, ZR Plus can be deployed in an unamplified topology over dark fiber, getting you roughly 80 kilometers of reach in 400 gig mode and up to 120 kilometers in 100 gig mode uh, when a simple kind of extended reach router interconnect architecture is, is all you really need. So it seems like just yesterday, the OIF released the 400 ZR specification, but the OIF 800 gig coherent project is well underway uh, and it's expected to deliver a formalized spec by the end of this year. Uh, more specifically, 800 gig ZR will really be an extension of 400 gig ZR, right? It's ushering in the next generation of high capacity DCI, 40 to 120 kilometers, but now at double the capacity in a QSFPDD or OSFP form factor in roughly a 25 watt power budget, right? So kind of a marginal increase from the ZR plus plugs that we see on the market today. Uh, and we'd expect to see modules start emerging in the market early next year with the ecosystem expanding through 2024 and 2025. Not too far after 800 gig ZR plus um, at a slightly higher power envelope will undoubtedly further disrupt the optical transport market, right? With 400 gig ZR plus interest in the Metro space is particularly high but for long haul and ultra long haul type use cases, the existing 400 gig ZR plus modules that we have today can't replace long haul transponders unless they're derated to 200 or 100 gig, right? So the performance in terms of capacity is not quite apples to apples. Uh, and that kind of changes with 800 gig ZR plus, which is expected to enable 800 gig in the Metro, roughly 500 kilometers, 600 gig regional. And lastly, but perhaps most interestingly, enable 400 gig long haul and ultra long haul performance, right? We're talking thousands of kilometers of reach. Uh, this use case is also what some folks in the industry are calling 400 gig ZR plus um, plus. With 400 gig ZR plus plus, really taking your 800 gig DSP and derating it to 400 gig, Coherent Optics will really be crossing another big milestone for service providers, uh, enabling the use of footprint optimized coherent plugs to displace dedicated transponder boxes, even in long haul and ultra long haul applications. So another newer development in the coherent optics world that's generating a lot of buzz with service providers at the edge of the network is the availability of coherent 100 gig ZR in the QSFP28 form factor. Uh, so 100 gig ZR is an IEEE standardized coherent DWDM pluggable that will do roughly 80 kilometers in an unamplified link and possibly 120 to 300 kilometers when amplified. Uh, and really 100 gig ZR is where we'll start to see coherent optics coming to the edge of the network where 10 gig DWDM no longer has sufficient uplink capacity to address the growth downstream from one gig to 10 gig or 10 gig to 25 gig. And really the advantages of 100 gig ZR over what we have today, which is really direct detect 100 gig ZR4 optics, proprietary optics, um, are, are twofold. Uh, 
First is the DWDM aspect, right? Whether that be in access networks or data center networks where fiber may be scarce or expensive to lease, having that DWDM capability allows essentially virtual in-field fiber expansion, right? Just multiplexing several wavelengths onto a composite signal proves to be a very attractive solution to grow in those, in those markets. And second is, of course, the reach capability. Coherent 100 gig ZR will enable you to service new use cases that were previously unreachable out of a QSFP28 plug. Um, it's worth calling out here that there have been 100 gig ZR solutions in the market for over a year, uh, but these have all been in the QSFP DD form factor. Right, effectively taking a 400 gig ZR, derating the DSP to 100 gig, what you end up with is a QSFPDD 100 gig module that still consumes upwards of 10 watts, which is tough to support in most widely deployed 100 gig ports today. But starting in 2024, thanks to the emergence of purpose-built 100 gig coherent DSPs, we'll likely begin to see strong adoption of QSFP 2800 gig ZR with a power envelope less than six watts, which is still higher than you'd typically budget for in QSFP 28, but supportable in most modern QSFP28 ports and also not too far off in terms of uh, power comparison uh, between 100 gig ZR and what we see today, widely deployed direct detect ER4, 4WDM40 type optics. With that, I'll pass it back to you, Sterling. Okay, thank you. Uh, and you've covered really uh, the, the dynamics here. I just wanted to show a bit of market data, in this case from our, our sister organization, Omdia, who tracks uh, closely all of the, the different pluggable ports. So this is their latest forecast looking at uh, the, the 400 gig uh, pluggables, the 100 gig pluggables, as you just talked about, and, and the 800 gig pluggables. So this, uh, I, I've kind of distilled from, from their data, what would be the, the, the pluggable formats that would be suitable for, for IP over DWDM, basically. Um, the, the numbers we talk quite a bit about the, the 400 gig, which is the, the, the purple uh, in this chart, uh, but you can see uptake expected on the 800 gig, uh, as well as in, in actually massive fashion units wise on the on the 100 gig. Um, uh, as of right now, it's labeled QSFP DD OSFP. As as Amog explained, that the the, um, the QSFP 28 will come out and, and they'll just incorporate that labeling when it when it does, but that would include that opportunity as well. The, the one point I'll make here is is that uh, we're, we're coming into an environment, especially in, in, so these are access opportunities, which is why that number gets gets so big so so fast uh, and pluggable into IP over DWDM routers. But really, plugging uh, I was just at the Fiber Connect show this week in, in Orlando, and um, there there's uh, showings of of these 100 gig pluggables into into OLT. So these types of coherent devices can can find their ways into lots of different devices, IP over DWDM. Changes kind of how, how we how we look at it, but there's lots of opportunity for for pluggables in the access, and then of course scaling it up as uh, Amog explained into the 800 gig opportunities. Uh, with that, let's uh, continue, and um, I believe uh, Amog. Uh, I'll I'll continue no, here. Standing. Thank you. Getting these all wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go That's ahead, Brian. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, so we talked about the pluggable transceivers, right? Uh, 400 gig ZR, ZR plus today, moving to 800 gig and uh, 100 gig uh, for the access um, tomorrow. But the pluggable, as we mentioned, this is an IP over DWDM solution. So the pluggable is one part of the solution. The other part is the host, the switch and the router. And because we see use cases for this integration in every router use case that we have today from uh, data center interconnect to uh, access and aggregation uh, edge and core and peering our approach is to provide this integration and we we have done that on all our routing portfolio that address all these different use cases. So the question is how to do this integration in a cost-effective uh, way that allow scalability over time to uh, and high density to integrate this uh, coherent, high-performance pluggables in an efficient way. So the, it starts from the host design. 
balanced chassis design that allow this scalability and integration cost effectively and allow the host to stay in the network for longer by this uh, eliminating or uh, reducing the need for forklifts and uh, reducing e-waste. The second important aspect of the system design is the flexibility of the system to address different use cases. We mentioned from access and aggregation to uh, uh, metro aggregation, core and peering, data center interconnect. It cannot be one design fit all. And here, uh, focused on having the right ASIC, the right switching solution for the application is key because it allows really uh, to address every use case that I just mentioned in an optimized way. And then the third uh, important aspect is the IP stack and the operating system, right? It's a, it's a router eventually. And here, uh, the robust operating system and mature IP stack is really key to enable this solution extension across all these use cases. Sterling? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Moran. So we're headed into the home stretch. Um, wanted to just put up a, a visual on uh, identifying challenges. Um, and, uh, and so this was uh, looking at, at network automation, and um, which is a, quite a, a buzzword these days and, and lots of interest. Uh, and we asked in this, what are, what are the biggest challenges uh, for network operators to achieve their, their automation strategies? Uh, automation is already indicated part of the value proposition here. Uh, complexity stood out, and this has happened in, in multiple surveys. Uh, complexity is the primary challenge. And so as we look at uh, automation moving forward, um, we do see a, a major shift required to, to move to multi-vendor interop uh, and, and openness. We've talked a bit about openness throughout this webinar. And I think in the final stretch, we'll, we'll hit here on a little bit more specifics on when we look at this particular architecture where, where openness would, would come into play. Um, with that, I'm not going to guess anymore who's up. So whoever's got this slide, fire away. Yeah, I'll take it. Thanks, Ther thanks Sterling. Um, it's not a you know it's not a surprise that when looking at metro modernization, the topic of management and automation can be a daunting one. Um, and I think a big part of that really has to do with being able to integrate previously siloed layers of the network in a way that's open and flexible enough to be tailored to the needs of every individual operator, right? So when we think about management and automation in a converged optical architecture, uh, optical routing architecture, it really, again, needs to start with standard APIs and open data models, right? So the diagram on this slide is an extrapolation of the SDN architecture proposed by TIP, the Telecom Infra Project, uh, which speaks to how through NetConf and support of open source data models like OpenConfig, uh, operators can work towards achieving unified management of IP optical networks with full multi-layer visibility. So starting on the bottom, you can see that there's still a clear demarcation between the routing side and the optical side, which are each managed through their respective IPR transport controllers. This is something that doesn't change even with IP optical integration, right? Your optical transport controller will still exist to manage the line system and will typically expose a standardized TAPI northbound interface. And your IP side controller, for instance, Juniper's Paragon, will expose northbound via a REST comp programmable interface. Uh, an interesting note here is that per the TIP model, the optical transport controller uh, at most gets read-only access to the IP router in order to view the open config state parameters associated with the coherent ZR, ZR plus transceiver sitting inside of it, but it's only the IP host, the router itself, that's able to configure the ZR, ZR plus optic sitting within it. So the idea is that up top, the use of a multi-layer orchestration tool can enable operators to functionally unify the data models from both IP and optical segments of the network into a common you know, network model, allowing you to manage across multiple domains with better end-to-end -end visibility. But at the end of the day, the key building block for the industry to get here is going to be support of open APIs and data models so that operators can integrate and interoperate a best-of-breed solution across different segments of the network. 
So, you know, I, I, I keep mentioning this idea of multi-layer visibility, uh, and I think Moran touched on it earlier in this session as well, and, and how this can play into the management and automation of converged networks. Uh, so let's look at protection as one practical example, right? So starting with the left diagram, this is intended to represent optical protection in traditional networks, right? If an operator were to implement protection on the router, because the IP router is separated from the line system by the DWDM transponder, it doesn't have direct visibility into layer one impairments, right? For instance, fiber cuts, which means until the transponder detects a failure, shuts down the gray optic link back to the router, the router has no idea that this particular path has an impairment, right? So what this diagram is showing is that for the router to establish a protection path in this kind of topology, it can take upwards of 50 milliseconds, which translates to packet loss and downtime. Now, alternatively, if you try to solve this problem by implementing protection on the optical layer, uh, well, sure, but this is typically done with wavelength redundancy, right? Having lambdas on hold in case they're needed to replace a faulty lambda, which amounts to a huge amount of idle WDM capacity which is simply not efficient for operators, especially as your traffic requirements only continue to grow. In contrast with IP over DWDM using ZR optics sitting in the router, acting as a layer one sensor, uh, you have now visibility into telemetry data that's indicative of the health of the line side link. So this diagram on the right-hand side shows how by setting pre-impairment thresholds for key optical health parameters like receive power, OSNR, and so on, the router can perform fast reroute in anticipation of an in incoming optical failure before something actually goes wrong, which means there's no performance impact, there's no packet loss, there's no need for idle one-to-one -one optical protection schemes because now you're protecting services and you're not protecting wavelengths. Um, so today we're talking about setting pre-impairment thresholds, but tomorrow when you feed such vast amounts of data to a powerful automation tool, it's not difficult to envision you know, machine learning models being trained to predict optical failures and proactively take corrective or preventative action uh, thanks to multi-layer visibility that the router and the IP service layer really has now. Okay, so I wanna kind of talk through, I know we have uh, kind of re getting to the top of the hour, uh, but switching gears a little bit, over the last year, as we've continued to kind of enhance our Juniper Cora solution, we've had a number of our customers, both in the cloud and service provider worlds, truly kind of materialize the promise of IP over DWDM. So I wanted to share kind of a customer case study, kind of talk through their journey with ZRZR Plus. Um, so this case study comes from a service provider who provides the infrastructure network that services higher education and research institutions in Sweden. Uh, this case study in particular, I think, is a compelling proof point of something I touched on earlier, which is uh, that thanks to the availability of zero dBm ZR plus optics, IP over DWDM is finally crossing the initial barrier for performance demanding service provider applications. So today this operator has currently deployed a 100 gig network. Um, and what's, per uh, what's particularly interesting is that the move to 400 gig coherent optics was actually a brownfield upgrade for them. Uh, today they're using larger CFP2 DCO 100 gig DWDM pluggables on dedicated 100 gig DWDM line cards, despite the footprint penalties that deterred many in the industry from adopting this solution in the past. And over the last few years, they saw unprecedented traffic growth and the need to upgrade to 400 gig was clear. Because they already had Rotoms in their transport network, the easiest path for them to upgrade to 400 gig was to use high power zero dBm ZR plus optics, which provided them with that higher transmit launch power necessary to go through multiple Rotom nodes. Uh, another very important point for this customer was vendor agnostic open config support, right? They place special focus on vendor neutrality and being able to integrate with their existing tooling of their choosing. Uh, ultimately, the Cora solution, which was a combination of zero dBm ZR plus optics, along with the PTX 10001 36MR, which can support zero dBm ZR plus interfaces at high densities, along with strong support of open config streaming telemetry ended up being the perfect fit for this customer, delivering four times the capacity at a third of the current power consumption uh, with an easy way for the core solution to kind of integrate into their existing third party management infrastructure. So last slide, I just wanna kind of put all the pieces together into some key takeaways. Um, first, for the first time with ZRZR Plus, we have undeniably entered the era of scalable and interoperable IP over DWDM, thanks to standardization, innovation and in coherent optics technology, and system design advances in thermal and power management, 
operators are, 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 are no longer sort of uh, deterred by the operational and technical barriers that came with prior generations of technology and are eager to integrate uh, DWDM transponder functionality into the IP service layer. And as a broader market view indicates, operators are already very much taking the first steps to make this transition, right? It started with cloud uh, for DCI with ZR, but now in 2023 and continuing to gain momentum in 2024, zero DBM ZR plus plugs will enable the integration into service provider networks with rotums or deployment in spans where fiber quality may be poor, finally bringing coherent optics to those use cases. And lastly, a successful IP over DWDM transformation has several pieces, but it really boils down to having extensible architectures enabled by standardization and a focus on open interoperable networks, sustainable systems enabled by both best in class system design and seamless coherent optics integration. And lastly, intelligent automation, right? Harnessing the power of open telemetry and power, powerful data-driven tools to automate full lifecycle network operations with better multi-layer visibility. And when all of these three pillars converge into a holistic solution like Quora, IP over DWDM really kind of becomes a no-brainer. With that, I'll pass it back to you, Sterling. I know we have a lot of questions. Uh, we do, yeah, thank you. Great job, uh, both Amog and, uh, and Moran. We, we do have about nine minutes left, so we'll start jumping in now. Uh, and uh, if you do, the audience, if you have questions, now's the time to, um, to, to fire away. Um, Moran, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, this one's kind of long, uh, maybe I'll summarize it a bit. Um, question is, uh, how, how is optical traffic grooming established in IP over DWDM? Um, and then there, there's some comments there. Um, but basically, I, I think that they're kind of wondering if, if there's trade-offs versus a traditional network architecture with, with, with grooming the traffic. Uh, and then their, their last bit is uh, they're talking about a backbone or regional long haul type of network. Can you, can you address that one for us, Moran? Yeah, so let's compare the two approaches, right? Typically in a um, traditional optical transport, you still have the router somewhere in the network connecting to that optical transponder. And the optical transponder can do the grooming. Typically today, it will be from 100, 100 gig interfaces to either 400 gig waves or 800 gig waves. It depends on the transponder technology. That's the grooming that is enabled typically by an optical tra uh, transport, optical transponders. On the other hand, if you uh, have this 400 gig ZR, ZR plus in the router, now the router become your aggregation and grooming device. And the router actually have much better granularity in uh, uh, addressing that uh, grooming functionality because it can go to lower interface rates, right? For, for example, for 10 gig, and you have the packet visibility in the router to do this grooming at, <clears throat> at the IP layer, not just at the transport layer one or layer zero uh, that the optical transponder is doing. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's see an another one. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, Moran, if, if you want to kick this one off and Amog, if, if you want to add to it, um, troubleshooting and maintaining IP over DWDM networks can be more complex due to the combination of IP and optical, um, identifying and resolving issues might require expertise in, in both domains. So specific to, to troubleshooting, uh, how, what, what is your recommendation? What, what, what are you seeing, Moran? And then uh, Amog, if you want to add. Yeah, so Amog, that that's it's a, is a really good question because today we have uh, two different, you can say two different silos, two different networks. We have the optical network, we have the IP network, we have two different teams that are managing these two networks. And Amog touched on the key uh, capabilities that are really enabling us to integrate that. And it starts from open APIs. So now the visibility of the optical layer within the router is, uh, is provided to the management systems. Now, 
I acknowledge that these two domains, right, optical is, there is a lot of expertise in managing optical network, right? Uh, OSNR, chromatic dispersion, this is a world of uh, analog long transmission that you, you really need to build your expertise in. And the IP domain, same thing, right? It's a digital, digital domain, but there is a lot of knowledge base associated with managing the IP network. So I'm not uh, advocating necessarily to eliminating one of these uh, function. I still think that you need both of them because now you, you still have these two functions, right? The optical function, the optical transport, and the IP uh, router, but it's just co-located now. And these teams maybe need to coordinate better, but providing open interfaces and uh, having the demarcation still, as Amog mentioned, since we have the control of the firmware within these pluggables, we can provide advanced capabilities that are not necessarily available in any of these 400 gig ZR, ZR plus um, pluggable. And the, one of these examples is the separation that the, uh, the person asking the question uh, referred to, the separation of the optical domain from the IP domain. And this is enabled by new firmware uh, revisions of the host interface. So the host can demarcate between the line side, the laser operation, and the IP operation to enable these two teams, the optical team and the IP team, to do their work um, essentially separately, but in coordination. All right. Yeah, there are a lot a, a good, good response. There's actually a couple other questions along those lines, but let me get one specific question came in for Amog, and if we have time, we'll, we'll kind of drill down further, but we are running out. Um, Amog, for you, somebody asked specific to, to, to your presentation slide, which specific machine learning solutions for predictive circuit protection are you aware of? I don't know if you're able to address that, but it was very specific to some comments you made. Yeah, so I think really the, the point I was trying to make on that slide is that getting to that level of, of kind of automation first needs to start with open models to access the telemetry statistics that are being you know collected by the router by way of the optics, right? Uh, and that starts with something like open config. So one example really is the Juniper Paragon automation suite. Right, we're kind of working towards Paragon Automation is a powerful data-driven tool that's able to leverage data from the optical layer in order to do something like this in the future. But in order to get there, we really need to start by building an ecosystem where our tools, our tooling infrastructure is able to pull data in a way that's not vendor locked in or proprietary um, and is able to make those kinds of, uh, build those types of models over time. So. There's not a specific one I can tell you today. It's something that functionality we certainly would like to introduce as part of Paragon in the future. Uh, but ultimately, it, it starts with those open data models and APIs to, to build fully connected automated solutions. Right, certainly one theme across all of this is, is open and uh, open, open APIs from, from that to, to the hardware, hardware, software, automation, management, control, the, the whole thing. Um, I don't think we're just up at the top of the hour. I don't think we have time to get into another topic. Um, I know, so the Juniper team does receive all the questions that came in. So if we weren't able to get to your question, uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to follow up individually post-show. Um, with that, thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. Thanks for your great questions. And, and of course, thank you to uh, Amog and Moran for your insightful presentations. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>